Diane, I'm listening to a podcast, Black Lodge Trivia Night. I've never heard so many game aspirations in my life. All right, welcome back to Black Lodge Trivia Night. Uh, as you can see, it's just art tonight. Uh, Patrick and Matt are not here. They are, uh, you know what, I couldn't even tell you. They're holed up in a hotel room in Las Vegas, ready to do their all-in fantasy hockey draft. So they won't be here tonight. We we keep talking about how, oh my God, this summer sucks so much. The summer wasn't over <laughs> when we tried to get our last recording session together. Didn't happen. So I wanted to cover something. You know, we haven't done a Bookhouse Boys in a while. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to... If you're watching this at the time of this recording, it's September 2024, getting late into the month. We've been doing our Mythos Imperative, I have it right here, Mythos Imperative um, Cold War Spy Game. I've got my little printout here. And in honor of doing Mythos Imperative, I'm going to chuck it to the side and look at M Space. Now, M Space is an offshoot of the Mythos rule set. Um, it's not by the same company. The company that does Mythos rule set is the design mechanism. This is done by Frostbite Books. It's by Clarence Red. You can sort of see his name right there. He's a writer and an artist from, I think, Sweden. I don't know if he had done any work before this in, turn, in the RPG space. Maybe he had done something for the design mechanism on spec. I, I don't know. Um, so what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to talk a little bit about M Space. I'm going to talk about the other books that come in the series. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I like it and what's important to me. And then in this new format where I'm sort of testing out, I know this is like a typical format, but I'm sort of testing it out for the first time on my end. It's going to be a lot of awkward hand modeling for no reason. Um, I've got some new toys that I'm trying to make sure work. So please, you know, forgive any technical hic hiccups. We'll see how it goes. But so with that, let me start with Mithras. So Mithras is, you know, by Pete Nash, Lawrence Whitaker, uh, by the design mechanism. You can see the you know, logo right there. Mithras comes out, I think, in around like 2016. It sort of is an offshoot from, I think, RuneQuest 6. I think they were doing work for RuneQuest 6. The license for that is going to start getting reverted back to maybe Chaosium. I'm not sure exactly who. And um, they decide, you know what? Like, we've put too much work into this, so let's sort of create our own rule set based on the work we've done. So they come up with a D100 system. Uh, like I said, I think it comes out in 2016. And I don't know if it's entirely meant to be a generic system at the time. They do release a... I'm looking over here because that's where I've got different things up. Uh, they do release a setting for it called Thenla, I believe. So the, they, they keep the setting separate from the rulebook, which makes me believe that they want this to be a little bit more broad than just a Thenla RPG. Around the same time, I, I don't know if I have a printout here. Uh, you know, a bunch of people start printing stuff for the game. And one of the things that they print out is uh, an adventure called, uh, I think, The Gift of Shamash. Shamash? A Gift from Shamash, I think. That's around 2016 as well. And what that is, is it's a sci-fi adventure using the Mithras rule set. Now, I don't know how much of this was concurrent. I don't know if one inspired the other. But around that same time in 2016, maybe 2017, I think 2016, M-Space comes out. Now, M-Space is a sort of, I don't want to call it like a space opera in the traditional Star Wars setting kind of vibe. It's its not that. It's, it's a more, I don't want to say, I guess you could say it's hard-ish sci-fi vibe to it. And I forget why I was looking at M Space. I was really getting into Mithras at the time. You know, I was running a Deus Volt adventure. Deus Volt was originally the, I think, legend RPG system from Mongoose. Couldn't find VTT support. I was pulling my hair out trying to get it to work online because it was an idea that I really wanted to run. Couldn't get it to work with the VTT and it was killing me. So finally, I stumbled across the Mithras VTT for Foundry and that solved all my issues, and I was off to the races and haven't looked back since. Um, I'll tell you what initially grabbed me. And so I was probably just searching around for Mithras. Oh, different things. I see a gift from Shamash. And then I see M Space. And right off the bat, you can see the cover, right? This has got the vibe of a lot of 
you know, free league, like Electric Bastion Land, and maybe that kind of. Well, you know, you know, Mr. Red's from Sweden, so like all those things, I think, are also from Scandinavia. Those RPG systems, a lot of them that they do, and they have like this vibe to their art that catches my eye Im immediately, like without hesitation, just immediately draws my attention. And I'm not really into what those games are doing from Free League, but I am very much into like big time sci-fi RPGs. So right here from the, the get-go, you see the cover. The, it's, it's like I said, it's got that sort of Scandinavian artwork vibe that you see a lot of in, in Free League games going on in the background. What grabbed me, I gotta be honest with you, was the person in the front. Um, and it's such a stupid thing, but it's a, so often you've got these covers and it's spaceships and rockets and torpedoes and all these fantastic things. And then here you have someone just walking along a riverfront, right? And you can sort of see in the background, maybe some, some, uh, days, your kind of bridges. I mean, they're probably still functioning, but you know, they've got a little bit of an old school vibe to them. It's sort of, so the sort of mix of the two really grabbed my attention. And in particular, it, it really pulled me into the world because I don't know if I've ever seen like sci-fi art where you just had somebody like living their life to that in a good way, mundane degree intermixed with this kind of epic sci-fi vibe. Sorry, I'm still getting over a cold. So um, right away that pulled me in. The rules themselves, you know, I figured I'd show you sort of the book. It's, you know, it's, you can get it through, uh, I think, drive through RPG. I think you can get it through Frostbite Books website. I'll try and include that kind of stuff in the show notes. Um, I don't know. This might be my second copy. I might have lost my original copy in a flood. And I was like, oh, maybe I won't get it again. Maybe I'll let it go. And then somebody, I think, sent me this. And that inspired me to then, you know, reacquire everything else I had before that. But, you know, so the, the, the cover art's really striking. If, if you've ever played a Mithras game, it's this is very, very simple. You know, you roll 3d6 for certain stats, uh, strength, constitution, size, dexterity, uh, maybe power, charisma, because then there's two of them. Size and intelligence, sorry. Size and intelligence, you roll a 2d6 plus 6. So you're guaranteed to get, you know, maybe above the, the average for those two if you're playing a human. Uh, then, you know, you just sort of derive a lot of stats from that, right? You know, you get like action points, damage modifiers, experience modifiers, healing rate. These are, if you played other D100 systems, these are things that are usually pretty common and you can sort of see like, you just like, what's this plus this gives you your damage modifier. What I like about this is that it um what i've always liked about mithras is that it strikes me as crunchy but reasonable and logical um a lot of these things here are things that are like one time setup right you just need to know this and then you got that and you're good to go you know charisma gives you an experience point modifier little touches like this i really like because yeah, it makes sense that if you're charismatic, you might be better at, you know, getting experience in a way. Uh, healing rates, you know, so it's, it, luck points is tied to power. So they give a lot of like nuance to the to the stats. Um, in my mind, without it being too crazy or without it being illogical. Then you got one thing I really like. You have uh, hit locations, so you can sort of calculate what you do here. Leg, abdomen, chest, arms, head. Uh, the way basic skills are derived, your starting scores, you take two stats and you add them together. That gives you your base. Sometimes you can see with like native tongue, they give you a bonus. Customs for your local custom, they give you a bonus. Then it just turns into a, you know, point buy system. There's sort of three rounds of point buy. Uh, you get 100 points to just spend when you start. Uh, I think you probably put those into your basic skills. Then you choose like a career uh, and you get another 100 points to spend. You know, you can sort of see some of the careers here, colonist, criminal. Uh, you can spend those 100 points on the skills listed under the standard skills and then you get to choose three of the professional skills. Put those 100 points in. And then finally, you just get a bonus 150 points to just spend on whatever. Uh, one of the things that I really like about the Mithra system, and I know it's not unique to it, but they have this passion system. 
and they carry that over here into uh, M space. And basically, it just gives you things to help shape your character. You can be passionate about a person, organizations, race or species, a place. And it's just ways to, you know, lend some flavor to your character. It gives you a stat you can roll against to make things interesting. Like, you know, like say you have a, a passion for like your daughter, a passion for family. Like you could encounter a moral choice and not really have a skill like, oh, what do I, but you could say, I don't know which way I would lean. How would my passion for my daughter influence this decision? And so with that, you could use that stat, in a, in, you know, in sort of like this more nebulous role-playing way. The other thing you could do is this game, and this is something I don't know if I've encountered in other systems, but you can use one skill to augment another. And so what that does is you take basically, I think, 20% of the skill you're augmenting with, and then you add that to the skill you're augmenting. So if you were like augmenting dance with your passion for your daughter, just to make it very weird, um, you would take 20% of that passion, add it to the target number of your dance score. It's like, God damn it, you know, if I don't pull this dance off, then my school's, my daughter's school doesn't get the, you know, gymnasium that they need or whatever, or electric boogaloo to or whatever. But you can sort of see how that works. And so the passion can be a really interesting way to influence it. Like, you know, is this skill check, you know, influenced by something I feel very passionately about or I hate? You can see right here, modifying skills. So um, I think that's what I'm doing. But yeah, and then the other thing, you know, so it's, it's you know, it's got a very typical D100, you know, very easy, easy, standard, hard, formal Herculean. This, you know, if you've played any Call of Cthulhu, I'm sure RuneQuest, uh, all this stuff comes, you know, is very similar. What I like about this is in Mithras, the division is like fractions. But I, let me just double check really quickly. Um, it's, it's fractional, but they don't in the character sheet. I was going to see if they have the character sheet here in the book, like maybe in the back. I think in the, yeah, so you can see the character sheet for Mithras. I think in the Call of Cthulhu, character sheet and I apologize if I have this wrong I think they give you ways like space to calculate the different levels of difficulty so you don't have to do the math on the fly Mithras you can see doesn't and so you're constantly like okay so what's like one fifth of 47 to get my you know formidable you know just that kind of math and you're just like okay here it just turns into straight modifiers and you get, uh, 40 20 20 40 80 which was also true of legend which is where you know the days of old system I was talking about earlier they do that. Um, so, you know, you get into uh, different kinds of roles, opposed roles, extended conflicts. I'll get into that in a second. Opposed roles is sort of the meat of a Mithras based system because combat and a lot of, I don't know, if, I don't know if Call of Cthulhu does this, but like I've played, you know, Columbia Games Harn Master, they have opposed roles for combat. Um, I feel like that's a very D100 thing to do. And it's basically how much you succeed above or be below your opponent determines what happens. Extended conflicts is something that I think Clarence Red added to the Mithras core like rules. I think this was his contribution to the rules. And what it is, is that, you know, a lot of generic systems, and this is what I'm gonna get into in a little bit. A lot of generic systems have this kind of idea, like Savage Worlds has it, I know, where it's just like, hey, you gotta set a time limit, the one ring, which is not generic, but I'm running that currently. They have a, a couple of systems that use this kind of base idea, which, and the idea is that you set a target, a time length, and a target number of successes you need to hit. And if you hit those many successes over a number of skill checks, you succeed. If you miss, you fail. So it's not that like the extended conflict is a revolutionary like game design unique to only M space, but bringing it into the Mithras rule set, in my mind, sort of flipped a switch for me in my head. And I'll get into that. And honestly, uh, I think it did in Mr. Red's head as well, because uh, if I bring this over here, he created basically an entire RPG based on that extended conflict model, which is basically you take you need to create a pool of, of hit points so you can it could be literally hit points. They even say in the book, like, hey, if you want to swap combat out for this extended combat, just do it. But basically you would take, like, say you're trying to 
hold a door from being broken down. So your strength pool might be, I mean, sorry, your dice pool might be your strength stat. The opponents might be their strength stat. And so that's your starting pool of hit points, so to speak. You do your skill checks. Whoever loses rolls, I think, a d6 and subtracts that from that pool. Things happen when you get to the halfway point. There's rules for, like, if you want to quit out in the middle. But basically, whoever hits, you know, whoever wears it down the most uh, loses. And that's how you sort of determine. It's the winner of that extended conflict. I use them in some adventures I've run when I was running M-Space. And like I said, I think the Komai engine by uh, Clarence Red um, takes that to the next level. Anyway, uh, but that's not the focus of this today. So you can sort of see like the sort of like, you know, if the protagonist has a critical sec success and the antagonist has a fumble, you get three levels of success. What that lets you do is it lets you trigger in combat, at least it lets you trigger special actions. Now, special actions, uh, they have a I'm going to get back to certain things in a, in a minute, but special effects, I guess they call them here and special effects. They give you a list of like special things you can do that sort of help move combat along. So it's not just a slog fest of like punch three points of damage, kick two points of damage. You can sort of see accidental injury, rise, bash. It lets you do certain things. Certain ones are marked as offensive. Certain ones are marked as defensive. Certain ones are stackable. So if you say like got three special effects and you wanted to do bypass armor three times, you could. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, uh, what else is stackable? Uh, maximize damage. Uh, counter real, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it tells you, you know, it breaks it down. Special weapon type, specific roles that you need to hit. Um, anyway, so this is like a nice little chart to explain how like special special effects work. You know, one of the crunchy things that a uh, Mithras family system has is it has this idea of impaling. I think this works better in melee, obviously. I don't know if they use it for firearms being able to like impale through armor or anything like that. So in fantasy games like Mithras or classic fantasy, like the ones that focus more on like your traditional fantasy, I feel like this stuff ends up being really cool. Um, you know, because it lets it, 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 what it does is it makes it so like, you know, if you take a dagger and try and stab a dragon, it's not going to impale it too much. But if you take a two handed sword and stab a like a kobold or something or something small frodo um you it'll just punch right through right so that sort of creates one of those things where it's a little crunchy but it's logical and it's not too overwhelming um there's a lot of things like that like it, it takes into account again in a mithras it's in here as well like uh the size of your shield or the size of your the weapon you're using to parry an attack versus the size of the weapon attacking makes a difference like little details like that that are crunchy but again i, I really like them um but yeah you know and then what i like about m space though to get back specifically here and away from mithras is i as i keep saying mithras is very crunchy and what this does is it takes the general mithras rules and it sort of streamlines them a little bit you know, they re I think they reduce some of the numbers of special actions. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, they switch the modifiers from fractional to negative 40, 20, you know. They create extended conflict, and that's going to be a big deal. Because then, because like they say, it's like if, if, this con if this combat system is too complicated, just do an extended conflict because it's very simple. But even beyond that, they give you another simplified combat. You know, if like you don't want something so... It's not even that like bogged down but if you don't want something that crunchy you just want to go they give you a simplified combat which captures a lot of the same things but just boom 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 they reduce the number of, of special effects they simplify them they take out hit locations they simplify how you you know obtain wounds maybe it makes it a little bit more similar to like a 2d6 system uh like when you hit a certain amount of hit points you start taking wounds um spot rules but but i appreciate that i appreciate that they sort of looked at it and said look if they're just looking to do run and gun sci-fi combat you know let's give that to them you know spot rules are basically like you know what happens if you fall what happens if you catch fire you know just things like that um 
and in a traditional like sort of sandboxy RPG sci-fi rule set, they give you rules for starship design. What I like about these rules is that it is it's clear that they took influence from Traveler, right? That's the that's the benchmark, that's the granddaddy of, you know, sci-fi RPGs. But if you know Traveler, you know that it can be it's, it's it can be you know it can be a lot to take in. The other thing I, I believe about Traveler, which you know I haven't read Traveler in a little while, is that this might feel this might not be accurate. This was my take the last time I read like Mongoose's Traveler two E rules. I'm just realizing. So I've got this new setup, and I think you know my camera. One of my cameras is here, but it's actually clamped to the table. I might need to eliminate that. I might need to get it off the table because I'm realizing when I do my bizarro hand modeling, I'm shaking a little bit. And also apologies. This camera here is just a it's an old GoPro. GoPros maybe the new ones are better, but man, like I've never been happy with how GoPros looked. Um, which is why for a long time I tried to set up things like this just using GoPros because they're so small and versatile and now they can do like 4K, 6K, whatever. Never been happy with the how they looked. I've never been happy with like the resolution of the image. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so what I like about the the starship rules, and it's gonna get into every sci-fi system they add, is that it's scaled back, it's simplified to degrees, a little more streamlined. And it's also it tries to use the framework of the general rules and apply them to starship combat. You know, all, all different kinds of things like that, where I felt like in Traveler, they're not afraid to sort of do s different systems, right? Like Starship Combat and Traveler, I think, can be pretty complicated. It's also very different than ground combat in my mind, as it should be in some degrees, because they're two different things. But this game tries, I think, to keep it all in the same ballpark to make it a little easier to grab, uh, to grasp. So, you know, you buy modules, which I think is something you can do. Um, you know, you can buy, you know, different, different things. You can, um, you know, you can sort of streamline your ship, which might help with like maneuverability, which I think is also something you do, at least in the old Traveler. But you can see like, you know, the speed handling, you know, the size is something that, you know, characters have. Uh, you know, they just try and keep it like in the basic ballpark of what you're doing. You can see like there's some calculated stats at the beginning. Um, and then, you know, like hit locations for your ships. They have ways to, you know, create what you need for that because every ship can be different. Uh, and you can sort of get an idea of here, like what the NPC ships, you know, sort of. This is two. Yeah, I was going to say this is two. That was like, you know, so it's a little bit streamlined for that. Um, but you can sort of see the character ship. You know, you list your modules here. Do you have streamlining? Is it stealth? Yeah, what are your weapons? It's not too crazy. Um, here's an example of one. I assume streamlining helps with maneuverability, but maybe loses some like space for modules. Um, but you get its speed, handling, shields, armor, hyperspace. You can sort of see if this is a trader ship. You can sort of see a blueprint of one here, which again, if you've done it, some traveler, like looks very similar. I think Starship Combat. Starship Combat. I found the one or two times I ran it was pretty straightforward what if I were to criticize it on some level I do feel like um it's not focused on getting everybody involved in the fight the way I would say like when I read in seven worlds for savage worlds uh, where their ship combat sort of feels like there's a little bit more for everybody to do but they do try and say like there's a little side passage getting everybody involved and um, for everything somebody else does, you get an action point. Now, I didn't explain this, but because I'm not trying to do like a, a like a page by page rules overview, but the way like combat works is you get a certain number of action points in Mithras. It's derived by certain stats, like maybe dexterity or something else. Um, so you could have two, you could have three and combat becomes this economy of action points. So when it's your turn, if you have an action point, you spend it, you get to do something. If you need to defend against an attack, 
you better have an action point in reserve. So it becomes this interesting choice, again, part of why I think it's crunchy, but interesting and logical. It becomes this economy of like, do I hold a point back because I'm going to need it to anticipate an attack? If you can get into a fight and you are really dexterous or really whatever, and you have four action points, say, you're like you're just off the charts, you can, you know, you can use that to your advantage. As, as it makes sense, you're faster. You can, you know, attack twice, you know, still have the speed and reserve to to defend still, you know, where they're spent. And one of the interesting things about this game is that, you know, if, say, somebody attacks you and misses, this is Mithras as a whole, if somebody attacks you and misses, you're not required to spend an action point. They've missed. But if you want to spend an action point, you still can. And if you can succeed, it's like getting a free counter of sorts, you know. Um, they, they've blown it. You don't have to worry about it. But if you still want to take a special action, if you want to go for that opportunity, you can still do it. Anyway, combat in here sort of works in similar ways where you sort of... I found it a little confusing at first, but players choose combat actions and roll pilot skill. So it's sort of an opposed role, just like regular combat is. You compare success levels, just like regular combat. You pick special effects, if any, just like regular combat. So then... This is where, you know, so gunnery initiative goes to the ship with the highest success level in piloting. So based on who has the highest level in step two, that's basically who gets to shoot. So then you shoot. Um, special effects can help with the shooting by doing offensive positioning. Uh, not sorry, you know, uh, it doesn't really. Uh, by doing like evasive flow, you know, choose location, different things you can do. Um, and so, yeah, so... If you chose like offensive positioning or hold steady, these are things that can affect the shot. Uh, and you just sort of, again, you compare success levels. Um, and eventually get to the final. And then this is what threw me the first time, I will say. Uh, initiative for the next pilot role goes to the ship with the highest success level in gunnery in, I think, like step three. So you sort of have to remember like, okay, so who won step three? Whoever won is now the attacker. Whoever's two is now the defender. I think that's what the initiative meant. Um, which for a little while threw me, but I think that's what, that's how it breaks down. It's just who's the attacker, who's the defender. And then you just go back into it. You know, you choose a combat action, you know, so you have to decide what you're going to do first. And then you decide if you succeed, you, know, you find out if you succeed. So. It's really, again, streamlined. If you've ever seen Traveler's Combat, there's like player aids involving massive hexagonal hexagonal um, maps with rules and rules and rules printed on the side. Uh, and it's not that it's bad in any way. It's really interesting, but it is much more involved. And like I said, it feels like it's sort of a separate system from what's in the rest of the game. Here... That's not the case, but, um, you know, so that's special effects, you know, spot rules again, ramming is just like falling, you know, in the other section again, but they give you a simplified starship combat. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Simplified again, sort of cuts down process and, you know, it just makes it again, if you want to make it boom, 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 you keep going. But then what they do for once, they go the other direction and they give you advanced starship combat. So if you really want some extra crunch, you can add modifiers, you get different types of, you know, firing modes, bursts, uh, you get damage ladders, uh, you get point defense systems, uh, firing arcs start to matter. So you can start to really turn it into pretty complicated involved maybe a more engaging system rules for creating aliens i'm not going to get too much into it but it gives you that tool um gives you different you know uh, different uh ways that you know to flesh out your aliens like you know advantages how do they communicate what are their weapons like uh you know what how do they just what do you describe you know stuff like that Get into their cultures if you want to do that. So, again, a total toolbox if you want to create alien species for your, your adventure. Um, histories of the, the culture. So here we can just, like, here's a, um, a life form, and this is like a, an alien basic table. So you can sort of jot down. So you can see it's not like a ton of information. 
to get your aliens up and running. Uh, this is a, you know, or maybe this is like, anyway, I was about to say it might be a little bit more. So this might be for like a specific alien. Um, if you need a, like an alien NPC. Most importantly, you know, if you want to do world building, uh, it gives you the rules for that. Like, you know, the size of your planet, you know, starport size. Is there life on the planet, the climate, atmosphere, just, you know, the basics. And then boom. This probably looks familiar to you if you've ever played Traveler. It's this sort of uh, sector map, hexagonal again. You can sort of see over here, it uses very similar symbology. So why not, right? It works for Traveler. If people are coming over from Traveler, they're probably fairly familiar with that. I don't think they use the um, hex system, like the AOB114, you know, that sort of nomenclature that Traveler uses that um, then you have to go translate. I don't think they use that. So anyway, so yeah, you can create worlds, you can create systems, you can sort of see the world here. Star type, you know, how many planets is it habitable, blah, 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 world one, two, three, whatever. You know, it sort of builds it out. Um, circles, I believe, is something in, let me see if it's in proper Mithras. I think it is and I think they use it for cults. They have a section called Cults and Brotherhoods. And that's sort of, it's a system of rules for an organization. I know it's called Cults and Brotherhoods, but you can use it for any organization. And here, um, they use it, you can say right here, there are four types of circles, organization, ideology, corporation, location. So these are just general things that would unify a local group of people into sort of a circle, a group, like what, would these people have in common? And again, it tries to take this sort of abstract thing and shape it into the general idea of the rules that have come before. So you can have like, uh, circles have influence, size, and resources. So influence could be one through 20. And it gives you an idea of just how big, like, so if it's 19 or 20, it's like just a massive, um, a massive, say, corporation. Size, right? Um, again, size is a stat that players have in roughly the same spread. So, you know, it gives you that. Um, you have attributes, sort of like you can have uh, skills, I think. And I th did they have special actions? Anyway, but anyway, so it lets you create um, ideas table if you want to like randomly generate. So it lets you create like a character for an organization that you can use to roll against, um, you know, like would this organization have influence in this sector? You could make it a difficult check because they're far away from the home base, but you could still roll it. You know, it gives you these things that can help you as a GM uh, decide things on the fly because it turns without having to like, okay, let me try and figure out, let me rules look up because it all sort of comes back to the same core. Um, psionics, I don't like psionics. They're here. I don't like it. Um, vehicle design. So again, if you want to design ground vehicles, they give you that. Uh, we already did spaceship design. So then we get to the technology, which is just like your equipment lists. And what you have here, as you can see, like blaster, heavy blaster, light blaster, force sword. They're going generic, but they're trying to, in my mind, they're going... Force sword feels like a lightsaber, right? It feels like they want to be able to include, like, hey, you want to play Star Wars with... I wish that they sort of got away from that a little bit and just made it a little bit more in the Traveler vein. And, you know, I'm sure Traveler has something similar, but um, I don't know. You know, because then going back to it, like the land speeder, speeder bikes, you know, these feel like, you know, they're names for something different. Uh, Starfighter, fast and fragile, slow and sturdy... A free trader is very much a traveler thing, but it could also be, you could think of it as like a Millennium Falcon. Uh, but that's that's my bias. It doesn't, you know, they don't specifically, you know, but, but let's look at it. You know, you got a speed of eight, handling size. Got, you know, some stats. You basically just need gunnery and I guess the pilot would be the pilot skill. But um, very simple and it all can move very quickly once you sort of do it again. You know, they give you some general monsters to give you some examples in the back. It's all good. Great. 
how to make expert characters, which is something I think they have in, yeah, the Mithras Companion, which is a separate book. If you want to make, uh, I think in like, say, Call of Cthulhu, they have, uh, what's that? Like the, the pulp Cthulhu, like it lets you sort of get extra points. I think they sort of let you do that here, like 450 instead of the standard 250. Uh, you can go super high up to 750. Anyway, so that's like the basics of the book. So, like I said, what grabbed me to it initially was the artwork, and I'll slow down a little bit. And um, and I, I don't know, like I said, I know you know Clarence Red is an artist. I don't know if he did a bunch of the artwork in in the interior. I don't know who. Um, but I will say, like shots like this, like this is in black and white. Um, I don't know if that's on a planetary surface or if that's like an asteroid field out in space. But whatever it is, it really sort of captures a sort of corporate Wayland yutani vibe of like just that kind of sci-fi RPG. This stuff feels a little bit, you know, that's not, I don't know. But it really was the artwork that first grabbed my attention. Uh, you know, shots like this. Um, you know, Zaxxon kind of jump gate, you know, again, it's in black and white, very moody. Uh, and so that, because, you know, again, I th feel like the point of the RPG, and this is why, like, while I really like the artwork that's in those Free League games I was trying to remember earlier, it didn't grab me, you know, like, because the subject matter of the art didn't grab me, but the style really did. But it wasn't enough to get me on board to play here, again, it, it really was. Uh, it really, really hooked me. So I wanted to, that's part of why I wanted to try and figure this out because the artwork, you know, it's got a little bit of a, I don't know, a cyberpunky vibe to it. I don't know. Really grabbed me. But like I said, like, and it provides like this really good core, what feels like a, a, a generic sandbox sci-fi starting point. Um, but we're not going to stop there because then what came next is a series of other books. Now, I don't know what came when. Um, there's actually... It's by uh, The Companions. We'll, we'll start with The Companion. Uh, there's uh, Elevation, Companion, Junkyard Blue, Circles of Steel... And I think there's another book, Reflex, Reflex. I used to have a hard copy of Reflex. I now only have it on PDF because again, I mentioned I lost a bunch of stuff in the flood. Um, anyway, so they come out with M Space and then they decide they wanna, again, this, this shot right here, again, the artwork immediately grabs, grabs me. And Scott Crowder then starts to get involved. I don't know when he actually got involved, but you, know, you start seeing his name on stuff. And um, what this does is it adds to it, you can see cybernetics, robots, Q-Tech, which is sort of like, might be like psionics, but for, for electronics. Origins, hacking, they do some stuff with combat, and then they give you an adventure. Again, that sort of striking, in my mind, Scandinavian art style of artwork applied to something I, a subject that I find fascinating. So they get into cybernetics, they give you the ability to create cybernetic characters. They sort of build off of like the spaceship design, so you have modules like the spaceships do. Um, they give you new careers uh, because they're introducing cybernetics. You know, you can sort of add prosthetics, uh, let you have robots. Robots, you can create a robotic character. Again, they use modules. Um, so they break down the modules, what they can do. Uh, and I don't like psionics. I'd rather have whatever powers you want to sort of incorporate into your story be done through cybernetics, things like that. Q-Tech is... It says right here, it's a tech implant that wraps itself around the user's neural cortex and sends out filaments, which winds blah, blah, blah. The problem is, again, is that this feels a little bit like psionics under a different name, but at least they try and sort of hard sci-fi explain it a little bit. Psionics feels like magic, and I don't want magic in my sci-fi. I feel like Q-Tech works a little bit better once you get into this, 
psionics, uh, not psionics, um, cybertech, and, you know, once you introduce hacking, because then, you know, whatever. The other thing that this book introduces that's really cool is this origin system. So one of the things that um, Traveler is famous for is its life path, character creation. Base, M Space doesn't have that. The companion introduces origins, which sort of give you that flavor. So you can pick templates or you can randomize them if you want. You know, you can see. Um, I think you can randomize them somehow, but you sort of pick a template and then you get life events. It gives you different professional skills. These things can give you like a boost in money. You can gain a contact, get a bonus to your standard skills. You know, sort of, sort of plays that. You can't die as far as I know, which is something that everybody loves about Traveler. But it does give you a lot more flavor to character creation, which again, like like the belt, right? You, you know, you can hate raiders, uh, someone hit the mother load, gain credits. So like it really gives you an opportunity to add some some background to your character creation. Um, so, and there's a lot of them, as you can see, right? Uh, now, once you choose that, then you can sort of get career, you know, life event tables. So there's, you know, another event you can roll and that can add even more. So if you, and you can see this goes from 51 to 100. These go from one to 50. So you can sort of like, if you're a rural origin merchant, you could roll this and then this, you could sort of pair them together and you get, get those. Um, I don't know if it's meant to be either or, or if you roll on both. Part of me feels like if they set it up to be one through 15 and 51 through 100, what I did when I ran it in, um, in Foundry is I think I sort of pulled them together and turned it into you roll once. And so you can either get a scout is this out of focus? It's hard to, I don't have a, anyway. Um, I did it where it was either or. So you get one event that happens in your life. It's either because of your background or because of your career. Again, like, I love that artwork. Inmate thief. So then they get into hacking, you know, again, um, they come up with systems that, again, I felt like, uh, again, I, I don't want to just explain the books, um, but they came up with systems for hacking that I felt like you can see like difficulty 0, 30, 50, 70, 90. Um, oops, I just banged my, my microphone. Um, they're not exactly the same numbers, but you can see that it, it's creating these tiers of difficulty and working from that, much like a regular skill check uh, goes into opposed roles. You can use extended conflict for hacking. Um, which I think is a good way to do it. You have different gear that can give you bonuses. Um, anyway, uh, they introduce more things with combat. They give you some more special effects. And I think a lot of these might be partly because of robots and cybernetics. So they sort of, and then they give you an adventure. Great. Uh, what I will say is, uh, so yeah, there's pre-generated characters you can download for the adventures. Um, Circles of Steel we'll get to in a minute. Odd Soot is sci-fi mysteries. And it's funny, they're just advertising other games by Frost. What I'm trying to find is, where did they put? One of these has an ad for, oh, we'll get to this in a second. So we get those. Uh, we'll do Circles of Steel really quickly, because what Circles of Steel is, is literally what it says. It's a bunch of circles. Um, cyborg circles, robot circles are just different organizations that you can add to your adventure or use them to sort of reskin however you need it. So it's just, again, it's more stuff. You know, we just looked at the companion. This is what I was looking for. Uh, the Triton incident is an introductory elevation scenario. So we're going to get to that in a minute. I highly recommend downloading it because this adventure, once I got hooked on the idea of M space, this adventure is the thing that's like, yes, I'm absolutely going to run it. You say a brilliant researcher is murdered on Farsight station and the player characters investigate. Nothing is quite like it seems. Then the real trouble starts. So it's a cozy murder mystery in space. And I was just like, I love it. 
I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they're not the first cozy mystery adventure in space, but I will say that I don't recall encountering that myself before I before I did this. So anyway, um, yeah, <clears throat> Circles of Steel, again, more really inspired artwork. Really love it. Uh, this is when we're going to get to the part that really made it all click. Elevation is by Michael Larimore. It is a sort of a source book. It's not a rule book. It's not, it's, it's a, it's a setting. I think there are two settings. One is the elevation setting. The other is, what's it called? It's called Reflex, which again, I wish I, I used to have a hard copy of it. I, I don't anymore. I definitely have the PDFs. Reflex as a setting is like, involved in like a dying space empire. So you can see it being a very traveler vibe kind of adventure uh, setting. You know, it takes place in the year 3300. It's, you know, it's very much like this space opera um, setting, if you want, in my mind, like this, the traveler vibe. Elevation is more near future. So to me, and it's, it's about the beginnings of humankind's exploration into space. So for me, it captured the more 2300 vibe. So if you know the difference between Traveler, they're both GDW games. Traveler is like this massive spanning setting where it's over like thousands of systems and it's it's kind of overwhelming. 2300 is very much like, it's, uh, it's not that it's a small setting, it's still pretty spread out. But it's really about, I think the cover, the old version, literally says, you know, mankind takes to the stars or something like that. So it involves some, some of our first contacts. It involves us getting out of our solar system into like Alpha Centauri into like nearby star systems. Um, you know, if you look at the, the setting map for Traveler, it's just like a gajillion star systems. If you look at the setting for Traveler 2300, the map that come, used to come with the game, it's like sort of very much near Earth stars, like within like 100 light years or something. I, I, don't quote me, but it's got a tighter feel, even though it's still pretty expansive. Elevation, like I said, it's sort of like that 2300. What captured the vibe for me was that 2300 vibe I was describing combined with the introductory adventure, which was like a cozy murder mystery on a space station. Combine those two things, I was like, oh shit, I'm off to the races. And what I liked about it was that it really, again, my goal is not to hand model and then go page by page. But what it really did is it fired off ideas in my mind. That's what I loved about M Space. Uh, that's what I love about Deus Volt. Like, what I really look for in settings and systems, rule sets, whatever, is that there's something there hard to this as well. There's something there that just starts firing the synapses. And you start making a connection and the story starts to come together or, oh, this is a really cool thing about a setting that I could then use in a different way, you know, things like that. And for me, M space was what did that for the general Mithras rule set. So the idea here is, you know, it gives you like this idea of like elevation is a circle. It's a corporation. It's basically, it's, it's a it's a corporation that wants to pioneer in sort of a idealistic way human space travel and finding out if we're alone in the universe. That's sort of its core ideal. And it has like an idealistic founder in its circle that goes missing trying to pursue that. You know, sort of like, you know, I'll be the brave one that makes the first jump in this new system, a uh, new ship that's going to take us out into the stars. Um... I'll show you a little bit here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, you know, they have like, you know, scenario hooks. You know, if you want something to get you going, they have like general NPCs, assassins, bureaucrats, criminal. You're seeing, you're not seeing like Jedi, you know, equivalents. You're just seeing general. Uh, they've got, I think, like a mini campaign here in the back, which is, I think you can use after the Triton incident. So you can download the Triton incident and then I think you can sort of have it lead into this, uh, it's a three scenario like mini campaign. Um, 
scenario two. Whoops, it's a lot of scenario one. Okay, so it's a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to give you some aliens that are unique to this. And again, like Traveler 2300, there's only a couple of alien species we've encountered. It's sort of the same thing here. They'll give you a couple because that's all we've done. What I'm trying to find is the equipment list. Um, they've got some galactic colonies. Not a ton of them. Again, like 2300, there's like some main ones like Alpha Centauri, but a lot of it's still up and coming. Um, but what I wanted to do, the reason I wanted to show you the equipment list, if I can find it, is because it sort of gives you the idea. What I was showing you with like the four sword in the main book. Here they have like a molecular blade, which feels a little bit more like what the GDW games would do. Stun stick. Uh, but then you get to like, you know, mag shotguns, plasma rifles, laser pistols, you know, so they give you these start to feel a little bit more with what I'm used to with a sci fi setting. So I think in that you can sort of see what they're trying to go for here as opposed to the more broad equipment list. So I, for me, I feel like you get M space, the rule book for me personally, then you absolutely get elevation, the setting. That's to me, the official setting here as well, because I'm looking for that 2300 vibe. So anyway, so that's elevation, you know, they give you again, some more circles, the order of science, um, things like that, uh, cypher corp. Anyway, then within all of this, there's like a, a, a main campaign book that they give you called Junkyard Blues. I'm not going to go into this too much. I've read it. I've never run it, but it's this really cool idea where your ship gets stranded in a space junkyard and it's all the things going on within that junkyard, the politics, getting out, etc. So it's a really, it's a really cool, and in my mind, it's in the elevation setting. I don't know if that's officially stated. I can't remember, but uh, it might, it might be. But in my mind, that, that's how I would do it. But it's, um, it's supposed to be really good. I've, like I said, I've never run it, but if you're looking for like a, a like a long term thing to run, you know, there's like I said, there's there's a three scenario mini campaign in this. They give you a little bit of one. There's the Triton incident. Reflux is its own setting with its own. Camp. So there's a lot of support to get you started if you want it. Uh, but oop, sorry, like I said, I'm sort of feeling this out and sort of new to it. Uh, so I apologize to bang my ca camera. M space comes out in 2016. I don't know how generic of a system Mithras was meant to be. And this is what, I won't say this is factually the thinking, but this is how in my mind, I started to see Mithras as more than just what Mithras was. I saw Mithras as, oh, the way I'm gonna run Days Vault. And I really like it. I found it very, when I was running it as Days Vault, I found it a little complicated. I found it, um, I don't know if I ever ran it 100% correctly. Now, granted, I only did like seven or eight sessions or whatever, maybe six, but I don't know if I ever ran it correctly because it's crunchy. Even though it's it's logical, it's still crunchy. And I was like, great, that's going to be how I run Days Vault. I don't know if I would ever run anything else. I might run Classic Fantasy if I, if I haven't mentioned Classic Fantasy. Classic Fantasy is Mithras rule set sort of adapted more toward an old school D&D style. So if you wanted to run those types of OSC style adventures, classic fantasy lets you do that. It takes the Mithric, Mithras structure to the rules and applies it to the D&D style gameplay of fantasy. I actually prefer it to Mithras because it allows you to, sorry, I'm gonna take a drink. I believe it allows you to add some combat rules at the time that were needed that sort of clarified how movement worked. Sort of simplifies the schools of spells to make it something we're a little more familiar with. Mithras is pretty well known for having like good schools of magic, but it's a little bit different. And some people have trouble, I think, with certain ones of them, but that, we're not talking about that. But M Space made me realize that Mithras could be a lot more than just the way I played Days Vault. And it made me appreciate the fact that I really like the core ideas of the system. Again, crunchy, but logical in my mind, at least. And I appreciated that 
it understood maybe there was a little bit too much to Mithras and they gave you ways to streamline it without having to homebrew it so that it could still, in a designed way, in a way that felt designed, make sense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then once I started thinking about M-Space, once I saw M-Space as sort of making Mithras feel more like a generic starting point, it sort of got me, you know, thinking about, you know, D100 systems and made me realize that when done in a, the right way, I genuinely really love a D100 system. And Call of Cthulhu is not it. Um, trying to think about like the old Merp, like Middle Earth role playing. Like, I really love those games, Iron Crown Enterprise. Those aren't it. Uh, this was the first time I was like, this is a great D100 core system that I would like to see used in other ways, or I would like to use it in other ways. And so M-Space is the reason why, again, if you're sort of watching this as, you know, when I'm recording in, in September 2024. And I've mentioned that, you know, we're running a Cold War espionage game. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what system to use for that, and I landed on you know, going with Mithras Imperative. You know, Mithras Imperative is the open license portion now of, of the Mithras rule set. It's, you know, free to use however you want. You just download it. You can make your own products for it. It's, you know, it's sort of like their open license, which a lot of systems have. But I wonder, in my mind, would this type of effort exist without... Frostbite Books, Clarence Red, seeing, and, and a gift from Shamash, which I, 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 I don't know, I have a copy of it somewhere and I don't know who wrote it. If they hadn't looked at Mithras and said, you know, this can do more. And then they start to expand upon it. The design mechanism, the company that makes the game, they end up creating, you know, they have classic fantasy. They do Destin now, which is like a superheroes version of the rules. Lioness, which is a... It's a, it's a fantasy, sort of sci-fi fantasy series, I think. Um, they do the rules for that. They have like Monster Island, which is sort of like that kind of King Kong pulp, which includes rules for hex crawling. They have their Mythic Earth series, which includes Polynesia, Babylon, Constantinople, Rome, Britain. So it's all these things that now those are a little bit more directly tied, I think, to the original Mythos rule set. But you get the idea that there's all these things that sort of developed and for me, M space was the key to unlocking Mithras as like a generic system. And I, I'm curious how much of this would exist if M space and a gift from Shamash hadn't looked at things and said, you know what, let's, let's take it out of the box and see what we can do. Like classic fantasy is still sort of within the box, if you get what I'm saying. But because then Mithras Imperative, you can see right from the cover, sci-fi, you know, the classic Mithras setting style is like sort of Bronze Age fantasy modern like western you know they really wanted to do it so it could cover everything and in my mind it's one of the better generic d system d100 systems out there uh, i really like where it's gone and i appreciate that they've made this effort to open it up and make it a little more accessible make it a little more wide-ranging and for me a lot of that started with m space so I don't think I would be running a Cold War spy game if I hadn't discovered M Space a number of years ago and uh, given it a shot and ran it and really enjoyed it. Now, ironically, the M Space campaign that I started with that Triton incident, I'm still running. I've since converted it to Savage Worlds and I don't want it to be a knock on the rule set itself. It was just a thing where like, not everybody loves D100. We've been playing for a while. VTT support at the time was different for Savage Worlds and for Mithras itself. A lot of the specifics about M Space that sort of simplified a little bit are not covered in the VTT. So you end up playing M Space with a little bit more of the heavier rules from Mithras because that's how the, the VTT works. So, and you know, and then I started to read Savage Worlds, and maybe that'll be another Bookhouse Boys at some point, but. And I was really curious to run that. 
had the seven worlds for hard sci-fi and I started to realize, you know, its flexibility, but I just wanted to go back and look at M Space again because there's a part of me that's like, I love this book. I love the setting of Elevation and all the things that it fired off idea-wise. I used it to create a, my M Space campaign takes place within our solar system. It's very much at the dawn of our ability to get out of our local space. But the Triton incident, Elevation as a setting, all that inspired my own sort of like Expanse-esque uh, campaign that I've been running now for a couple of years. And I think the players are still enjoying it. And, you know, like obviously a lot of crossover with inspired by Traveler. I believe there's somebody out there on the internet and I'll see if I can find the website and include it on in the show notes. I'll probably forget, but if somebody was running the Pirates of Drenax, which is like that classic Traveler sandbox campaign that you know has a lot of love they were running in m space you know so if you wanted to literally run traveler um but you found maybe traveler a little too cumbersome you wanted something a little more streamlined you know or if you just prefer d100 mechanics like this can do that you know there are people out there that have done the conversions already and you can do that but anyway so i just wanted to you know do you know an overview a quick you know, look at the M space line and hopefully, you know, again, it's been out for a while, so it's not like it's brand new. It's, I'm not, if I were smart, I'd be doing something for the clicks like shadow dark or whatever. I don't know, but I just wanted to sort of take a look at this showcase a little bit because it's been very important to my more modern RPG path. And yeah, it's just, it's, I find it amazing what happens when a rule set or a system or an adventure just clicks. I think that's part of the magic of running role playing games and why we do it, right? Whether it's like the world building in a, in a, in a rule set, you know, something gets you inspired or, or setting to get you to want to create adventures and homebrew or whatever, whatever it is. Um, that's the magic of what an RPG adventure setting or a rule set can do. And for me, M Space is one of them. And so I just wanted to uh, go through it and show you guys what I think is a really great D100 sci fi game. So thank you. If you've checked this out, if you're watching this, you have found our YouTube channel. Um, like, subscribe if this stuff interests you. Look for audio versions of things like this, our actual plays of tabletop RPGs, or our, you know, somewhat sporadic RPG discussion podcast. Again, just search for Blacklash Trivia Night where we get your audio. And uh, we should show up there. Uh, if you want to talk about CRPGs and mainly RPGs, we have a Discord channel that'll be in the show notes as well. Jump in if you want. And otherwise, we appreciate it. You know, again, this was the very last week of summer when we were supposed to record and things just fell apart. So, but this gives me a chance to, you know, play with some new toys, try something else out that's a little bit different. And um, hopefully, you know, this lets us cover some things that we might not have been able to cover before. Because, like, there's no reason why, like, I couldn't be showing you this and have Matt and Patrick on and we can figure something out like that. But anyway, yeah, this has been Black Lodge Trivia Night. I'm Art. Matt and Patrick, you know, will be back with our next recording at some point. We're doing... A little bit of Eat the Reich at the moment. We're doing the Cold War spy game using Mythos Imperative. Matt's prepping some Delta Green that's on deck. We might be doing a session of Into the Odd. I'm not 100% sure. We started one, me and Patrick. We might be doing our second session pretty soon. So a lot of tabletop stuff happening. And um, on the CRPG side, we've got the expansion to Elden Ring and the book quest for Lord of the Rings Online at the moment. So again, appreciate everybody's check this stuff out. Hopefully this was interesting. Hopefully at least give the PDFs a check. Download the free Triton incident. Uh, there's some things that are free. Just, you know, check those out. Um, I think they're absolutely worth taking a look at just to see what it, it sparks in your mind. So thanks again. Take care. Talk soon. The music during the RPG session in Foundry was provided by the Foundry module Tabletop RPG Music and composed by Ian Fisher. 
You can find his Patreon at www.patreon.com slash tabletoprpgmusic, all one word. <laughs>